So let me now finally get to my two-dimensional spin model. It's very, very simple. All I do is modify what is we usually have for a spin one-half. Spin one-half is described by the three components of the Pauli spin vector operator and the identity. Anfano in 1957 in the reviews of modern physics wrote this down that says when you put a bunch of spins through a magnetic field that they will be polarized in the direction of the magnetic field, NMR. That's what we do all the time. So this is what we have for a statistical ensemble of spins that have passed the stern gerlach filter. My model, which I came up with actually in 2006, says I'm just going to change this. Instead of this particular algebra of these operators, I'm going to assume that the spin is described by sigma x, sigma z, and i sigma y. Makes a big difference. And this is one particle in isotropy before it reaches the filter. And this is the generalization down to one particle, and I won't get into it except to say that you cannot write this down unless you have a completely isotropic space. If you have a magnetic field on, you can't write this down. I don't want to go into the details about that right now. But it is important to realize that this gives you a two-dimensional structure for spin with a small change. This corresponds to angular momentum. This corresponds to angular momentum. So I've got two orthogonal axes of angular momentum. And I sigma y is a phase. E to the I sigma is a phase. So this is a phase factor. And what that phase factor does is it orients my two-dimensional spin in three-dimensional space. And because sigma z and sigma x are indistinguishable, these two forms are indistinguishable. And that's why you get this form. It's, it is important for me to mention that this is done in the laboratory frame. This is the laboratory frame axis. Let's say it's the p direction or the z direction. This is a body fixed frame of every spin. Every spin that comes out of there randomly has a different body fixed frame. So I have local hidden variables here, which are the angles, theta phi, that relate this coordinate system to the laboratory frame. So every spin comes out oriented differently. If you did put that spin into a magnetic field, you destroy half the correlation. Basically what's happening here is that let's take I have a two-dimensional spin, and let's suppose I apply the magnetic field, the probe field in this direction. Then deterministically, one axis lines up, and deterministically I've done the quantum calculation that's true to, to prove it. One axis lines up, and so you get it polarized along that laboratory z direction, and the other component, x, processes in the xy plane and averages away. Or, if the magnetic field is closer to the x-axis, it receives a greater torque, the x-axis lines up, and the, and the z component processes and averages away in the z y plane. In other words, when you look at that spin, you destroy half the correlation if it's two-dimensional. That's what I'm saying. A little, when you put a magnetic field on, one axis lines up, and the other one just processes away and averages away. And you lose, as I mentioned, half the correlation between them. OK. And that recovers, then, the usual point particle description of spin with a single axis of quantization. All right. We have no trouble talking about the spin from the Fano density operator, which is 1 plus sigma i. And this, we're taking a pure state. So I'm going to take this as a 1 in there. The polarization vector has magnitude 1. So we have two states. And this is already diagonalized in the laboratory frame. So we have spin up and spin down. The usual quantum states exist of 1, 0, and 0, 1. And if we operate sigma z on these states, we get the eigenvalues of plus or minus 1. Just what Bell assumed and what everybody assumes about a spin 1 half. Single axis of quantization, spin up or spin down. But when you look at my single spin with two axes of quantization, it is indeed non-diagonal. It's a Hadamard matrix, by the way, but that has no relevance to what I'm talking about. It's in the body frame. It's got the identity, and it's got the z components from sigma z and the off-diagonal x directions, and I'm in the z representation of this particular spin. So what I have to do is diagonalize that little 2 by 2 matrix. 
And when I diagonalize it, I get states for a single particle which are superpositions of the two axes of quantization here, z and x. And the eigenvalues of these equations, sigma z plus sigma x, are plus or minus root 2, mainly because the state bisects the two axes, and just by Pythagoras, they sum up to square root of 2, the length. So Bell assumed plus or minus 1, but when you don't look at it, and you assume two axes of quantization, you get plus or minus root 2 as the eigenvalues instead of plus or minus 1. There's nothing special about this particular quadrant. In fact, I can use the four quadrants and then solve the problem in the four quadrants by introducing two more hidden variables, nz and nx, which take values of plus or minus 1. Then I get what is, makes a lot of sense, really, a vertical and a horizontal component. But it's important to remember this is one particle and a local realistic model and so it can only be in one state at any instant. It can be plus, or it can be minus, or it can be on this direction, or minus, but it cannot be in a superposition. It can be in one at any instant, because it's a pure state of a single particle, and it can only be in this state. Symmetry tells me that these two are equal and opposite, and these two are equal and opposite, and it's reminiscent, of course, of the vertical and horizontal components that you see in, for example, in, in photons. The other thing, too, is what I'm saying in this model is that if you have a spin in the magnetic field that stands up, it has plus or minus one states. But when I take off the field and I have an isotropic situation, it falls down into a state of zero angular momentum, into an effective magnetic monopole, because that's what you have here. There's, it's either in this or this direction, and the average out to give me zero angular momentum. So that is my spin model. Does it work? Well, I wouldn't be here if I didn't have some convincing evidence that it does work. So, the first thing is, if I simulate that by averaging over all the local hidden variables, those n's and the theta phi, then what I do is I reproduce, as I you saw, exactly the correlations, but it's subtle. It's not quite as simple as I said at the beginning. It is not fortuitous that the angles that give you the maximum violation of Bell's inequalities of 45 degrees apart have the same structure as my two-dimensional spin because there are correlations that lie in orthogonal directions. And so there is a very definite relationship between these. The way I do the simulation is the way we teach undergraduate spectroscopy. Same thing. Anybody who's taken a course in undergraduate spectroscopy, let's give you an example. We want to do, look at the rotational spectroscopy of a diatomic. We take the diatomic, we go into the body frame, we set up the symmetry axis, we set up the states, JM, the rotational states, we rotate from the body frame to the laboratory frame, where we have spherical harmonics, and then we calculate the transition matrix elements, get the rotational spectrum when those transition matrix elements are evaluated. I do exactly the same thing for my structured spin, one at a time. You take your two-dimensional spin, I diagonalize it so I've got my, my uh, rotational states, which are here now, the pure states, plus or minus one. I take those states and I transform with a rotation to the laboratory frame. That's what we do with the diatomic molecule. I then define an operator that corresponds to clicks. Plus plus is transmission, minus minus is absorption, A is the direction of the filter angles. And these are the usual quantum states. And they will give us clicks. When I solve that equation, this is what you get for A. A, if you recall, then, is this operator. What I get is diagonal terms. I'm in the Z representation of these states, and I get quantum coherences that correspond to the X components. So the diagonal ones, you can measure their eigenvalues, but the off-diagonal elements are quantum coherences. You can't measure them. Those correspond to those terms which are going to process at right angles to the symmetry axis. These quantities, A and A, A minus plus and A plus minus, just come out of working out the matrix elements. It's a bit tedious, but it comes out.
and one corresponds to the even quadrants and the other to the odd quadrants. So I got plus, minus, and minus, plus. They just differ by plus or minus. They depend upon the settings of the filter angles A and the other local hidden variables, which are theta and phi. I'll come back to that in a minute. And then what I do is I say, you know, I cannot include the off-diagonal elements because I don't know how to deal with them. They're quantum coherences. We don't measure quantum coherences. All we can measure are eigenvalues. And so I'm going to drop them and drop those quantum coherences. And for Alice, with filter setting A, I will keep the diagonal elements. And for Bob, I will keep the diagonal elements, but not the off-diagonal. The change in sign is just for conservation of angular momentum. And when I do that calculation, I get, I take products, and I get, when I take the products, and I average over 10 million different orientations of these particles, so of course they have to be the same. These are the same because Alice and Bob started at the same source, so they separate and they maintain the same local hidden variables. And when I do that, I get half the correlation. That's what I expected because I throw away the quantum coherences in the calculation. You cannot measure two non-commuting operators at the same time. So that's why I threw them away. And I get half the correlation exactly minus one-half cosine theta. How do I get at those quantum coherences? How will I get them back? Well, you would just do a unitary transformation. Transform from the Z representation of this resolution of the identity, and we transform to the X representation. It's just a simple two-by-two two matrix to change from the Z representation to the X. And when you do that, you swap these terms. And so the X components become diagonal, and the Z components become off-diagonal. Now, I've got in the X representation one plus plus minus and plus minus, whereas in the other case I have minus plus minus plus. Well, it turns out they give exactly the same results. And so you need two experiments and you need two calculations to get out all the correlation. And then what you do is you sum the two. And when you sum the two, you get the full correlation that's available. In other words, this treatment of the simulation you need to do two calculations because the observables are complementary. And that's how I get these curves here. Now, it turns out, though, that you cannot experimentally determine whether spin has one axis of quantization or two. It's because they're complementary and you need two experiments. If you measure in this direction, you'll see one axis. If you measure in any other direction, you'll see one axis. There is no experimental way, because we're below measurement now, of determining whether or not a spin has one axis of quantization or two. If you want one axis of quantization, have one axis of quantization and have non-locality. Or if you want two axis of quantization, then you have locality and you have determinism. But there's more. There is evidence here that this two-dimensional spin is right. And the reason for this is the model predicts the filter angles that maximize the violation. One-dimensional spin will not do this.